what is this all about? So every day we're hearing something new about gas stoves, whether they're going to be quote unquote banned, whether they're dangerous, whether our freedom is going to be taken away by people who want to take our gas stoves. And, you know, for people who ask that question, I think it's a very temporary situation to uh, be concerned about somebody taking away your gas stove. I think it's a great time to consider replacing your gas stove. And how can you get help doing that? You know, while some people are worried about the federal government taking away their gas stoves, there are others who are pretty happy about um, opportunities to replace. So here we have uh, the Biden administration not banning gas stoves. Oh, well. And now we have uh, the reasons why they might want to warn us about our gas stoves, because there are a lot of health impacts, um, but there are also opportunities to replace your gas stoves uh, with the help of federal funding. And there are state level programs and even local programs that can help you replace your gas stove. Now, why would we want to do that? Uh, here's one reason why from the American Public Health Association. This is a statement that they put together in November of last year, but they have just released it. A public health concern, exposure to indoor nitrogen dioxide increases the risk of illness in children, older adults, and people with underlying health conditions. You know, why would you be worried about somebody taking that away from you? <laughs> um, I'm more concerned about Yes, these impacts, there's a couple of new studies that show that these stoves leak methane and even benzene that are harmful to our health. And Zach will go into more details about things like that. Uh, there's studies, recent studies that show that 12% of childhood asthma that may have come from gas stoves. Um, now here in Denver, uh, we have, uh, we are considering not just a gas ban appliance, but there have been movements. I'm part of a movement to electrify buildings. That means get gas out of all buildings because gas is bad. Using fossil fuels like gas in the home is bad for our indoor air quality and bad for our climate. And there have been efforts to get Denver to, um, with its new building code, its building code revisions, to require single family, new single family homes not to be hooked up to gas. Um, new commercial buildings and um, uh, businesses are required to ha have space heating and water heating be electric. Uh, they can still have gas, but new homes don't have any of those requirements. Um, and there's a movement, you know, even though the building code process left us out of, uh, left that question out of the proposed building code, we are still working to revise the building code and I will reach out to you all so that you can give your input to Denver. Denver is also doing some good things. Uh, we are working with Block Power to retrofit financially distressed properties. Um, it's a great new pilot program and I hope that cities in Colorado, across Colorado will um, follow suit. Um, in the meantime, I should have mentioned that Crested Butte has banned gas from new single family homes and several other communities are doing the same. So we can, we can improve what Denver's doing. We can build on what Denver's doing. Um, all our suburban counties and cities uh, can learn, you know, we should all come together to share information, to look at models across the country and locally so that we can all benefit from cleaner indoor air and do our uh, part to um, address the building sector's impact on the climate, which is very, very substantial. So um, yeah, I'm coordinator with PSR Colorado and this is our um, Healthy Electric Homes video page. And I just wanted to take a minute to share this TV ad that we put together with Colorado Rising last year. Um, just to get everybody started and set the stage for Zach's um, presentation. So here we go. Let me pull this back. Okay. Calling something natural doesn't make it clean or healthy. Natural gas is really methane gas, a dirty fossil fuel, just like coal and oil. 
Using gas for cooking and heating releases chemicals that can cause diseases, especially for kids, the elderly, and communities of color. Protect your family's health. Move up to clean electric stoves and heat pumps, and look for these appliances when buying or renting a new home. We also have some other videos. Uh, this one mentions um, a bill that was passed by the state whereby builders have to inform uh, prospective buyers that they have the right and opportunity to um, go all electric. Um, so we'll talk about policy more later, but I just want to let you know that we have a lot of resources on our webpage and we have me and I will be informing you about uh, some of our upcoming events, including uh, our um, presentation with Black Parents United Foundation on February 26th at Brother Jeff's Cultural Center. This is going to be very exciting, and we're going to talk about healthy electric homes. We'll have the city of Denver there talking about their pilot program, and um, just looking forward to a lot of opportunities to work together on these issues. So, that's my little presentation. And here is Zach Williams, uh, the health and education expert on gas stoves and health effects from PSR National. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Lauren, for that wonderful introduction. Let me quickly share my screen here. Sure. <laughs> no worries, here we go. There we go. Alrighty, folks. So thank you so much for uh, joining this presentation today. Uh, just like Lauren said, my name is Zach Williams. I am the health educator and campaign coordinator for the PSR National Office. Um, and I am uh, delighted today to bring you this uh, webinar and health educational series called Cooking with Gas, the Health Harms from Gas Stoves. Uh, today's presentation is going to be about 45 to 60 minutes, um, and first some logistics. So as I begin and continue the presentation, please drop any and all questions that you have into the Q&A box uh, labeled at the bottom of your screen. This Q&A box is specifically for questions that you have about content and material and anything that comes up. Um, we will be answering all of these questions at a Q&A portion at the uh, end of the content of this presentation. Um, and if you have any comments, concerns, you know, anything that isn't a question and you would just like to respond to or start a conversation, you can by all means throw that right in the chat. Um, the chat isn't going to be where questions are. Uh, please put your questions in the Q&A function, but any other kind of thing that you would like to talk about, uh, please throw that right in the chat so we can all see. Um, please, uh, this, this is a more formal webinar style we've set up in Zoom, so uh, you will not see uh, your faces or uh, the other uh, attendees' faces, just mine and Lauren's, um, but please feel free, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and we will unmute you, um, and there are a couple of audience participation sections in this, so just like uh, I said, you can throw your answers to those questions into the chat, or if you're feeling brave today, uh, you can, by all means, um, un raise your hand and I will unmute yourself and I will unmute you so you can uh, say your answer out loud. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So I don't think I need to go through in detail about who F Physicians for Social Responsibility is, um, but just some high level bullet points. We're a national organization of 33,000 members. We mainly mobilize health professionals and physicians to advocate for climate solutions and a nuclear weapons free world. Um, over the course of this next hour or so, these are the big ticket items that we will go to. And these are also the three sections that I've broken down um, the presentation into today. So first and foremost, um, you will be able to articulate how cooking with gas appliances produces indoor dangerous indoor air pollution and explain the health effects of each pollutant. You'll be able to recognize and prioritize vulnerable populations and frontline populations, as well as understand why they are more vulnerable. And lastly, you'll be able to address the health effects of gas stove pollution and explain to patients, friends, families, and loved ones um, the steps they can take to reduce their risk and also how you, steps you can take to reduce your risk as well. 
This is a big long paragraph telling you that this is CME and CEU accredited. So if anyone is a physician or a nurse looking to get uh, one CME credit or one CEU credit hour for this presentation, uh, there'll be instructions on how to claim that. This is a slide telling you and promising you I am not trying to sell you anything during this presentation. And without further ado, I'd like to start us off by asking a favor. Uh, if you could please complete this short Google form pretest before we get going, that would be great. It is six questions, um, nothing too serious. And this is mainly so that we can gauge and uh, we can gauge learning uh, con content knowledge beforehand and content knowledge after so we can see uh, how well this webinar does at actually teaching and educating folks about gas appliance pollution. So I just dropped the link into the chat. Um, or if you have a smartphone, you can scan that QR code right on your screen and it'll take you right to the Google form uh, to fill it out. Um, just so we don't uh, go over time, I'm going to say the next 60, 90 seconds would be great. Um, they're short answer, not, not short answer, pardon me. They're multiple choice um, and multiple select questions, so you can do it pretty quick. Um, so I'll keep my eye on the clock and we'll get going in the next minute or so. So if everyone can take a moment to fill out that um, Google form, that would be great. Thank you so much. And Representative Joseph, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for coming in. And I'd be happy to hopefully we can share some research um, and some evidence for your gas stove bill. Mr. Prather, thank you so much for joining from the uh, Denver Office of Climate Action and Sustainability. Great for you all to be here. And yes, uh, Representative Joseph, we will absolutely be going over um, equity issues in terms of environmental justice and environmental racism in terms of gas appliance pollution. Alrighty, folks, I'll say another 20 seconds ish. Want to be mindful of everyone's time. Alrighty, then, folks. Thank you so much for completing that uh, short pretest. If you didn't, it's all right. Uh, and before we get going to the content, I hate webinars that are just 60 minutes of someone talking at you. So I have a moment of audience participation. Um, I have a question for all of you. Please feel free to throw your answers into the chat or raise your hand uh, and I will unmute you to say your answer on loud. But it's pretty basic. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of gas stoves? This may have changed over the past 21 days, but what's the first thing that comes to your mind? You can either throw it in the chat or raise your hand. Chef's kitchen, sure thing. Dirty, as a cook, I like them better than electric. Here, Gwen, I'll unmute you real quick. Efficiency, can you hear me? Yep, there we go. Efficiency, great, okay. And we have misinformation, fire, old fashioned, scary, instant control of the heat, older house kitchen, pollution, blue flame. Great, okay. Uh, they told us it was clean. That I, I'll, I'll cap it at that. Sally, thank you so much because that's actually the end all like uh, point I would like to get across is that no matter what we think about a gas stove, if we think it's better, if we like it better, if we have horror stories of those, you know, resistance electric coils that took 84 years to boil water, um, the fact of the matter is the oil and gas industry spent a lot of money over the past 60 years to convince <clears throat> the American public that natural gas is cleaner and better than electric cooking. Hence the phrase, what comes to mind with me 
is uh, the phrase cooking with gas, the colloquialism we have in the States. You know, your car won't turn over and then all of a sudden it starts and now we're cooking with gas. It's a positive thing. It's a positive connotation. And that is due to the work of communication strategies from the oil and gas industry to convince us it was clean and better. However, and Brandy, thank you so much. Gas hissing, absolutely, which we'll get to when we talk about leaking out of the uh, gas stove. Now, no matter what we think about gas stoves, um, the fact of the matter, the fact remains that using a gas stove without ventilation produces dangerous indoor air pollution in our kitchens. This leads us to the first section of this training, which is understanding the pollutants that are produced by gas stoves and the health effects they have on the human body. So first and foremost, the primary pollutants produced by gas stoves include nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, and particulate matter, which includes both PM 2.5 and PM 0.1, which is also known as ultrafine particulate matter, if you've heard that phrase before. There are certainly more pollutants that come out when you burn methane, but these are the primary pollutants um, that we see when we measure indoor air quality uh, and gas stoves. So gas stoves produce many air pollutants and the primary of which are those three. So let's go through what each of these do to the human body. First and foremost, nitrogen dioxide. It is a harmful air pollutant that is produced by the combustion of fossil fuels, which includes the methane we burn in our stoves. NO2 contributes to the development of asthma, aggravated asthma, and increased susceptibility to respiratory infections. It is also associated with negative general cognitive functioning and worsening of working memory development and cognitive development in children. Next, carbon monoxide is another dangerous gas and perhaps it's more well known than nitrogen dioxide. Exposure to carbon monoxide can have neurological effects such as fatigue, impaired vision, dizziness, and all the way to falling into a coma. For cardiac patients, CO can also cause chest pain and discomfort. And at high enough levels or at long enough exposures, carbon monoxide can also lead to carbon monoxide poisoning, which is fatal. Lastly is particulate matter, both PM 2.5 and PM 0.1. PM 2.5 is any matter that is smaller than 2.5 microns in diameter and PM 0.1 is any matter smaller than 100 nanometers or 0.1 microns. For context, particles smaller than 2.5 microns are much smaller than the width of a human hair, and they settle on the walls of our lungs, which then set off a cascade of inflammatory changes, which can lead to heart and lung disease. Ultrafine particles, which are the ones that are smaller than 100 nanometers, actually can translocate directly into our bloodstream from either our lungs or our sinus vasculature, which then they travel throughout the body and they can even cross the blood brain barrier and accumulate in brain tissue and cardiac tissue, which can lead to myocardial infarctions or heart attacks or strokes. PM 2.5 and PM 0.1 can also aggravate asthma, decrease lung function, and increase existing respiratory symptoms. They could also contribute to non-fatal heart attacks, irregular heartbeat, and premature death in folks living with heart or lung disease. Now, particulate matter has an asterisk next to it because the amount of PM that you can measure and see in a kitchen is actually directly to related to what is actually being cooked. Fats and oils, like the olive oil, butter, avocado oil, all of the lard, Crisco, all the things we use to pan fry foods actually contribute the most particulate matter. So if you're pan frying something with olive oil, you're going to get more particulate matter than if you're just boiling water. However, when you're just boiling water or just have the burner on, you still get levels of particulate matter. The fats and the oils contribute much more particulate matter. So these are all the awful things that happen to the human body when we're exposed to these pollutants. But expo expose, exposure, that's the point. How much are we actually breathing this in? So let's look at some data. On the left, 
you will see the national standards and guidelines relating to specifically NO2 concentrations. The United States does not have indoor air quality standards, so we use outdoor standards for reference. The US EPA national outdoor standard is 100 parts per billion for the one hour average, and the World Health Organization's indoor standard is 106 parts per billion. For context, one part per billion is like adding a single drop from a dropper into an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So even though 100 might be a big number, 100 parts per billion is actually not that big of a concentration, which the EPA is saying, hey, you should probably not be around a concentration that, uh, of higher than this for longer than an hour. Otherwise, it's going to cause serious health effects. So... Data from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory showed that in houses that were less than a 1,500 square feet, indoor air levels of NOx exceeded EPA ambient air standards more than 83% of the time when folks were cooking with a gas stove without ventilation. And this goes up to exceeding the standards 100% of the time in homes that were smaller than 1,000 square feet. That's an important point and a lot of words, so I actually want to show you it graphically. Here's a graph I pulled from that Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory study, and I'll explain uh, the graph here a little bit. So over here on the y-axis, we have NO2 concentration, and it's not even units. It's a logarithmic scale. So we have 10 here, 100 here, and 1,000 here. So these are pretty big jumps in units uh, which eat with each of these lines. The x-axis is simply time of day, so 8 a.m., 10 a.m., noon, 2 p.m., 4 p.m. And the red line is the measured NO2 concentration in the kitchen, and the blue line is the measured NO2 concentration in a hallway or bedroom farther away from the kitchen. These shaded pink parts are the amount of time and the length of time that the researchers were performing each cooking function. So roasting in the oven, turning the range on to cook on top, roasting in the oven, turning the range on to cook on top. And this house three, they were looking at eight houses. This house three is kind of the perfect storm of bad things when it comes to gas appliance pollution. It is less than a thousand square feet, it is an older home. It does not have an exhaust hood or ventilation over the stove, and it's an older stove. So kind of the perfect storm to get bad concentrations. So here, this 100 line is what the EPA is saying, please do not be around a concentration higher than this for longer than an hour, because then it will start to impact your health. And as we can see, every time that gas stove is on, that concentration skyrockets above 100 parts per billion. Um, and even in a, in a place in the house that's not the kitchen, maybe not the first time you use it, but as that gas stove is being used all day, that concentration doesn't dissipate and gets worse. So this is just to show you that, yes, indeed, when you use a gas stove, when you're burning methane in your home, you are being exposed to what the EPA says is a dangerous concentration of nitrogen dioxide. Next, I want to zoom in to uh, a specific health issue to use as a lens to look at this a little deeper. So the primary gas stove pollutants can have long-lasting impacts on uh, human health, and this is a case study illustrating the impact of NO2 concentrations on rates of specifically childhood asthma. So this is a study entitled Associations of Changes in Air Quality with Incident Asthma in Children in California, 1993 to 2014. Long title, all you need to know that this is a multi-level longitudinal cohort study over 21 years. For those who aren't versed in research methods, this is essentially saying it is one of the best research methods to look at effects over time and it wasn't two, three years, it was over two decades. So let's focus over here on the nitrogen dioxide graph on the left-hand side. Each of these pretty colors is a different community in Southern California, primarily around Los Angeles. 
Now, over here on the y-axis, we have asthma incidence rate. So how many cases of asthma, new cases of asthma that we're seeing. And over here on the x-axis, we have nitrogen dioxide concentration, but it's inversed. We have high concentration over here and low concentration over here. And as you can see, as Los Angeles and Southern California got its act together and cleaned up the smog, cleaned up the ozone, cleaned up the nitrogen dioxide, they saw fewer cases of childhood asthma as the concentration of ambient NO2 went down. So ultimately, what I'm trying to show here is that when we decrease nitrogen dioxide, we also decrease the amount of childhood asthma that we see. And the focus on children here is particularly important because it leads us into the second section of this training, which is vulnerable populations and frontline populations. Now, uh, children happen to be one of the most susceptible populations to air pollution in general and gas stove pollution specifically. So first we have a couple reasons for this. First of all, children have higher breathing rates. Second of all, children have higher lung surface to body weight ratios and smaller bodies. So an NO2 concentration that could be safe for an adult could be harmful for a child. Lastly, children's immature respiratory and immune systems are still undergoing development and don't necessarily have the ability to deal with stressors in the same way that adults can. While exactly how the mix of NO2, CO, and particulate matter and other gas stove pollutants affects childhood respiratory illness, that soup isn't exactly well known. Uh, the, the specific effects of that soup on child respiratory illness isn't well known. A meta-analysis looking at the association between gas stoves and childhood asthma found that children in homes with gas stoves have a 42% increased risk of experiencing asthma symptoms, a 24% increased risk of ever being diagnosed with asthma, and an overall 32% increased risk of current and lifetime asthma. This may suggest that this soup of multiple pollutants coming out of gas stoves together poses a higher risk to children than if it was simply just NO2 alone. Now, I wanna continue the conversation about vulnerable populations um, and continue speaking about children and childhood asthma, but in the context of something that's incredibly important to this work, which is environmental justice. Not every child is equally exposed to gas stove pollutants, and thus the distribution of childhood asthma is skewed. The data I'm about to show you come from the National Center of Environmental Health and the Journal of Urban Health. I'm not gonna go through every single percentage point that you're about to see on the slide, but I just wanna point out some important differences uh, in each of these sections. So first, let's look at housing type. So 21.8% of children living in public housing have asthma compared to just 7.38% of children living in private residences. Next, in looking at race and ethnicity, the prevalence of asthma in Puerto Rican children is almost twice that of white children, and the prevalence of asthma in black children is more than twice that of white children. And lastly, looking at income level and socioeconomic status, 11.8% of children living below the poverty line deal with asthma compared to just 5.9% of children at 450% of the poverty level or higher. So living in a non-private dwelling, being black, and living below the federal poverty level are all risk factors for childhood asthma, which is one of the most prominent health effects of gas stove use. And why is this? So to fully understand why being a person of color and of low socioeconomic status puts you at higher risk of respiratory illness in the United States, we must look back at our history. So I'm about to present some examples 
of why there are such disparities. This is not an exhaustive list of why there is environmental racism in the United States. These are merely just examples. So first and foremost, federal housing and transportation policies codified racism into the economic and geographic development of the United States in the mid 20th century. First, the Federal Housing Act of 1949 authorized the demolition of black neighborhoods and the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 authorized the demolition of urban neighborhoods labeled as urban slums and replaced them with the nascent interstate highway system. When I say urban slums, these were typically black, Hispanic, and low socioeconomic status communities. This not only severed communities, most often black neighborhoods, but also constructed long-term polluting transportation infrastructure next to, near, or simply through communities of color. Secondly, although it is outlawed today, many majority black neighborhoods are still reeling from the effects of redlining. Redlining is a homeowner's loan corporation categorization strategy, where some neighborhoods were labeled as high risk, whose neighborhoods should not be given access to mortgages. These neighborhoods were outlined in red on their maps, hence the name redlining. However, redlining now refers to lending discrimination that bases credit decisions on the location of a property to the exclusion of characteristics of the borrower or the property. In the post-Civil War era of Reconstruction and through the first half of the 20th century, the Great Migration took place, where millions of Black Americans moved from the South to Northern cities for economic opportunity and to escape the horrors of Jim Crow. In response to this influx of Black residents, Many cities across America used redlining as a policy and housing practice to keep cities segregated and keep Black folks out of white neighborhoods. Redlining prevented investments in infrastructure, green space, public transportation, business development, and all other aspects of city planning that make for a successful, prosperous, and healthy neighborhood. Because banks refused to give loans to Black Americans decades ago, their descendants now deal with increased levels of air pollution and a lack of political will to competently and systemically address these issues. And when I say lack of political will, that is not on the part of the citizenry, it is on the part of the electeds that have the power to turn the levers and don't. So, Environmental justice is also not just about addressing racism. We can dive even deeper into environmental justice and talk about classism and socioeconomic status, which uh, goes across all races and ethnicities. So this is a health equity issue and lower income households are at higher risk of being exposed to high levels of gas stove pollution. Why is this? First and foremost, smaller unit sizes. It's important to remember that a couple slides ago, homes that are less than a thousand square feet exceed the ambient air standards for NO2 100% of the time if they use a gas stove and they are not ventilating while they are using it. Along with smaller unit sizes, there are usually more people per home than, low, than higher income households. So not only are more folks using the gas stove daily, but more folks are also being exposed to the pollution that it's creating. Next, low income families are also more likely to live in older homes and have less control over the maintenance of their appliances. Older homes may have gas stoves that haven't been properly adjusted in years or may still have a pilot light and are more likely to have inadequate ventilation over the stove or no ventilation at all. Having a cooking appliance with a pilot light means there is methane burning constantly in your home at any given moment, at any given day. It's great and convenient when you want ramen noodles at 2 a.m., but it's still the fact that methane is burning constantly in your home. 
Most gas stoves nowadays use a sparker mechanism, which is what you hear if you turn that dial and it goes click, 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 click. That's the sparker mechanism to ignite the flame. However, older stoves in older homes may still have a pilot light. Next, low-income homes are also more likely to use stoves and ovens for heat. Homes with inadequate ventilation, poor landlord management, and poor insulation make families in these situations turn to the most readily available source for heat for relief, which is typically the kitchen oven, which does the job. It heats, it heats the home and it provides relief from the cold while also pumping the home full of air pollutants. Next, low-income homes are also more likely to have higher exposure to outdoor air pollution for all the reasons we just talked about on the previous slide, living near transportation infrastructure, the NIMBY movement, so high-income neighborhoods don't have to deal with sewage treatment plants, power plants, industry, food distribution centers, but they end up in low-income neighborhoods with diesel trucks, you know, parking lots of highways next to them. So they have more ambient air pollution outdoors, which if you open your window to ventilate, the ambient outdoor pollution then comes in. Finally, low-income households are also more likely to already have a greater asthma burden, making them more sensitive to lower levels of NO2 than a higher income household that doesn't already have that greater asthma burden. So I just threw a lot of depressing information at you. And, you know, we never present a problem without a solution. So we're going to end on an upswing and tell you what you can actually do about this. But before we get there, I have another audience participation question for us. So again, throw it in the chat, raise your hand to unmute yourself, whatever you want to do. But have you ever seen any of these health issues in your patients, in your friends, your family, your loved ones, yourself? Have you ever noticed any of these health issues come up um, when using a gas stove? And this also applies to gas furnaces, gas water heaters, gas fireplaces. Any kind of gas appliance also produces these same pollutants. So has anyone ever noticed or experienced any kind of respiratory or otherwise health issue um, when using a gas appliance, specifically a gas stove? Don't all jump at once, it's okay. Alrighty. No worries if if anyone hasn't. You know these are these are you know specific personal anecdotes. Um, if no one has, uh, if no one's seen this before, I'll share an anecdote. Um, it's not mine, but it's from a, a colleague of mine at the PSR San Francisco Bay uh, chapter. Uh, you know San Francisco. It has four seasons. Um, you know it gets cold in the winter, and she had uh, a gas furnace in her home. And notice that every winter when it would turn on, her wheezing and her asthma would get so bad. And she just attributed it to it's the winter, it's allergies, it's the dry air from the furnace. It, you know, she just kind of white knuckled and dealt with it. Um, they recently, a couple years ago, changed from a gas furnace to an electric heat pump, which does both heating and cooling entirely electric. And as soon as they switched from a gas furnace to an electric heat pump, her winter, her winter wheezing and asthma went away. And it really clicked in her head that after they made the switch, she finally realized that, oh my goodness, it's, it's the gas appliance that was making me wheeze and making me have um, sensitivity uh, in my respiratory system. Uh, Lauren, my family always had a gas stove. Uh, my father had lung disease and my mom has COPD. It is, you know, it's true. We've, we've, you know, been around this and have been told that it's the best thing. It's great. It's better than electric. But, you know, I, I think of it like smoking on airplanes, like cars without seatbelts, like lead paint. It's going to be something that 20 years from now, we're going to look back and say, and how did we let an open flame of pollutants burn in our homes? You know, um, it's it. Thank you for sharing, Lauren. It's it's you know something that a lot of families have to deal with. So thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Uh, before I move on, does anyone have a comment, 
anecdote, thoughts? I see from Polly, I had asthma as a child, but we uh, don't remember what stove we had. For our two other kids, the correlation might be strong for bad air days in Denver, actually. So, so this brings up a good point that air quality in general, not just talking about gas stoves, but air, you know, the air quality um, in general in this field in environmental science and environmental health, it is, it is hard to say, you know, it is that power plant, it's this car, it's that gas stove, it's this building, because it is just all contributing to a soup of air pollution that is ambient and all around us at the same time. So it's hard to say, you know, it's this, it's that, it's whatever. Um, but when you do an experimental scientific study, you cover the gas stove and extract all the pollute and the gas that's coming out of it, it shows that this the gas stove is creating these pollutants. I see uh, can exhaust from a furnace that goes outside close to our bedroom cause breathing symptoms. Um, sure. Um, I, I, you know, I can't tell you yes or no, because, you know, if it's a windy day and it blows back into your home, if it's a windy day and it blows out of your home, um, the, this is the whole thing with ambient air is kind of difficult to say yes or no, but I will say that if it is a gas furnace, it's still producing NO2, carbon monoxide and particulate matter, um, whether it's vented outside or inside. And if it's vented outside, you know, it's not in your home, but it's in your community now. Um, so I will say that about causing breathing symptoms. I'm making my parents get rid of their gas stove. The stats are crazy. It's, I mean, it's pretty wild that, you know, I mean, thank goodness it became the new culture war because I really don't think that people, you know, thought about this at all. You know, it's the prestige item. It's, you know, the photo shoot and home and gardens. You know, I want the gas stove. It looks nice. Um, but it really is wild how how dangerous it could be. Would it be safe to say that gas heaters and gas fireplaces will follow suit? Um, I'm going to say yes. It's ultimately, no matter what appliance the methane is going into, when you combust methane, you get NO2, carbon monoxide, and particulate matter. Whether it's burning methane in a power plant, burning methane in your stove, burning methane in a furnace, burning methane in the fireplace, when you combust natural gas, methane, you create air pollutants. Um, so whether it's a gas heater or gas fireplace, I really think it's the wave is coming where folks are gonna realize, you know, it's not, it's gonna be part government regulation and it's gonna be part consumer choice. You know, folks stopped smoking cigarettes because of the truth campaign. You know, folks wanted seatbelts in their cars because of car accidents. It's, it's gonna be this push from consumers to say, hey, wait a minute, I don't want the unhealthy thing. Please give me the healthy thing. Um, is uh, Krupp, another childhood respiratory complaint, also related to air quality in the home? Polly, uh, I cannot say yes or no because I do not know enough about um, that specific uh, childhood respiratory complaint, but I am happy to look at some data and research and get back to you on that. Absolutely. And yes, thank you. Lauren, please place all of the questions in the Q&A box and we'll have an extensive Q&A session um at the end of this all righty so in the interest of everyone's time we're already at the 46 mark uh thank you for all for sharing your thoughts and thank you lauren for sharing your anecdote um let's continue on to all right what are we going to do about it it's harming our lungs it's harming our bodies and what do we do so before i get to actually like what you can do in your kitchen i want to talk about solutions first so to properly address this complex health issue, the solution should be multifaceted and systemic. First and foremost, the solution should address the target health effects that patients, your family, you, your loved ones are experiencing and be within feasible and correct medical practice. Ideally, the solution should also incorporate and acknowledge the living environment of the people being affected and should aim to improve the quality of that environment. The intersection of these three core aspects is the ideal, perfect situation. However, we all live in reality where nothing is perfect. So to that end, let's now talk about some things that we can do to address gas stove pollution. This primarily is going to be for the health professionals in the room, but it is also important to know uh, for our non-health professionals in the room who is at risk and what 
what behaviors and lifestyle choices uh, put us more at risk. So we already talked about Asperger's populations and here's a laundry list. So we already talked about children, but of course the other end of the age spectrum, the elderly of course are more susceptible to uh, air pollutants as well. Folks living with diabetes, folks of low socioeconomic status, folks living with obesity, and people with pre-existing heart and lung conditions are all uh, going to feel the effects of gas stove pollution more. In terms of lifestyle and behavior risks, um, hobbies, and what I mean by hobbies is do you run outside in an area of high air pollution? Do the things that you do put you in a space where you are being exposed to higher levels of air pollution? Ventilation. Do you have access to ventilation? Do you have an exhaust hood over your uh, stove? And if you do, do you use it? I know how loud <laughs> those things are and how often people don't want to turn on the exhaust hood. But you know, if you have access to it, do you use it? Um, smoking. Of course, if you're a smoker, your lungs are going to be degraded than a non-smoker and feel the effects more so. Um, do you use fossil fuels inside the home? Do you have a gas connection? If you don't have a gas connection, great. You're ahead of the curve. If you have a gas connection and are using fossil fuels in the home, you are obviously going to be exposed to higher levels of fossil fuel pollution. Um, time spent in heavy traffic, in car, and I should also put in school bus behaviors because kids are around school buses all the time. What is your behavior in a car? Do you spend time in the parking lot of the interstate trying to commute to work? Um, you know, car exhaust is also a soup of air, be it air pollutants. So if you're exposed to those air pollutants, you're going to feel the effects of gas stove pollution more so. And next, of course, living near an industrial or a fracking site, it's going to create more air pollution. You're going to be exposed to it and it's going to impact your lungs and you're going to feel the effects of air pollution more so than someone who wasn't living near these sites. Next, again, this is primarily for the health professionals in the room, but uh, let's go to risk management. So at the patient level, I don't need to tell y'all how to be doctors and nurses. I think y'all know how to address the health conditions, y'all the ones that went to the expensive schools. So address health conditions, get the kids some albuterol, a rescue inhaler, you know, steroids, whatever they need to address the symptoms that they're feeling right now. And then vague symptomology. This is good for everyone, but also particular for the health professionals. If, a, if someone comes in and presents with headaches, wheezing, fatigue, sneeze, like at, po, runny, runny nose, you know, these are all vague symptoms that could be allergies, it could be a viral infection, it could be a lot of different things. But I just say this to say, don't ignore it. And when someone comes in with a lot of respiratory issues, just like how you would ask someone if they're a smoker, you know, what, what's your exposure to air pollution? Just in the back of your mind, hey, do you have a gas connection? Do you have a gas stove? Do you have a gas furnace? Just something to keep in mind when you're doing your, you know, 10 minutes in the room with a patient. I realize that it is not, you're not sitting there for 45 minutes getting their whole history. Um, next, at the policy level, your state medical and medical specialty societies are wonderful venues to try and get this to be acknowledged and dealt with on a, you know, a wider stage and a louder voice. Um, the American Medical Association recognizes this and has a, a climate change policy, which they adopted in 2019, saying the importance of physician involvement in policymaking and encourages physicians to act as role models for sustainability. And more recently, the AMA has actually come out specifically and said there is an association between gas stove use and childhood asthma, as has the Massachusetts Medical Society, the Northeast Regional Medical Society, and the American Public Health Association have all put out statements saying gas use in the home is associated with asthma, respiratory symptoms. The language is different for each organization. But Ultimately, there are major medical societies that are saying, hi, we as doctors realize that this is an issue and we have a formal statement about it. So if your state doesn't, it's a wonderful time to go to the Colorado Medical Society and, and you know, raise your hand, submit a comment, try and get some kind of resolution pushed through for Colorado uh, to recognize the, the dangers of gas stoves. Next, um, your local county and state legislators. Um, thank you, uh, Representative, for being here today. We are honored to have you today. 
And being a politically active citizen as a health professional is one of the most important steps you can take, because I'm telling you, when you go into a city council meeting, a town hall, or you submit comment to a state uh, state bill, and you have comma MD, comma RN, comma DMT, DNP, your voice holds a lot of weight. Legislators and electeds listen to doctors. They listen to nurses. They listen to health professionals. So this is me on my soapbox urging you to be a politically active citizen as a health professional. And even if you're not a health professional, be a politically active citizen and make this something that electeds cannot ignore and must deal with it. Um, particularly if there are legislative efforts for electrification uh, and for anything that deals with changing zoning codes, anything that deals with buildings, is going to help a lot if the medical community comes in and weighs in, and it's not just the enviros, it's not just the building developers, it's not just the gas manufacturers and the gas industry. Having doctors, nurses, and health professionals there matters a lot. And now I'll get off my soapbox. And now I'll tell you what you can do in your kitchen to reduce your own risk, your family's risk, and what you can tell your patients to do as well. So I'm gonna go through each of these little bubbles real quick. So first and foremost, install and maintain a carbon monoxide detector. Most carbon monoxide detectors only go off when you're at risk for carbon monoxide poisoning. It goes off when, you know, it's leave the area, you're gonna die, like leave, leave, leave. I would suggest getting a carbon monoxide detector that actually goes off at a lower level so that you can know when to open your window, when to turn on the exhaust hood, when to try and get that airflow going. Um, and it's not you know, high enough to kill you, but it's low enough to cause some damage. Um, next, if it's available, run your exhaust hood. I know it's loud. I know it's a cacophony of that fan sucking in air from your kitchen. However, that is the exact point of it. It needs to be loud because the fan needs to have enough power to suck up the pollutants and get it out of here. Um, even if you don't have the, here's the thing, your washer and dryer need to be, exha need to be um, exhausted to the outside, need to be vented to the outside. Your dishwasher needs to be vented to the outside. Your stove does not legally need to be vented to the outside. So for example, I rent here in New York City, and even though I'm the health guy, health educator for gas stoves, I have a gas stove. Um, my exhaust hood is the fan in the microwave above my stove, which simply just pushes it over my head and spills it out to the rest of my kitchen. It is not perfect, and it certainly does not get rid of the air pollution, but at least it creates some airflow to get to the open window at the other side of my kitchen. It is not perfect. It's better than nothing, though, if you can't replace your gas stove. Next, um, open a window while you're cooking. This is free 99. And again, it's not a perfect solution um, because you know you could have bad ambient air quality outdoors. It could be wildfire season. It could be blizzarding. It could be negative two in Denver. Um, so I realize that it's not a perfect solution, but it's the simplest and easiest if you're really just trying to reduce the levels of air pollutants concentration in your kitchen. Um, this is something that I didn't realize until I started doing this work, but cook on the back burners. Um, when you cook on the front burners and you have your exhaust hood on, the pollutants are actually much more likely to just spill out into your kitchen than to get caught by the exhaust hood. If you cook on the back burners, the pollutants are much more likely to get caught by the exhaust hood and either vented outside or part of the airflow in your kitchen to uh, create some airflow. Alt those are all solutions. Um, I wouldn't say solutions. Those are mitigation strategies, adaptation strategies to deal with the pollution if you can't not use your gas stove. You know, if you need to turn that burner on, those are some things you can do. Ultimately, though, the solution here is to reduce the amount of times that you are turning on that burner. So Use electric appliances like a toaster oven, an air fryer, a kettle, anything that is plug in, plug out countertop to reduce the amount of times that you are turning on your burner. If you're looking for that pan fry function because, you know, you can't sear a steak in an air fryer, 
there are countertop plug-in plug-out induction electric uh stove tops and and burners um a single burner will run you about 60 bucks a double burner is around 110 120 um and it's a great ad adaptation solution to you can't replace your gas stove you can't rip it out of your wall but you don't want to use it anymore so these uh little small induction cooktops um are great if you still want to pan fry but you don't want to turn on your burner you know this is what i tell people get a big butcher block it, you know if you're in an apartment and you're you know scrounging for counter space get a big butcher block cutting board put it right on your gas range so it's a visual cue of oh wait i'm not going to use that and then just use these plug-in plug-out electric appliances for any time you need to cook um ultimately though to get to the root cause of fossil fuel pollution in your kitchen, you need to take out the fossil fuel appliance from your kitchen and switch to an electric induction stove. And before do I go, I go to my induction stove spotlight for a minute. I will just say that I say the root cause and the best solution is actually getting rid of the gas stove, which isn't possible for renters. It might not be a financial feasibility. I understand that completely. However, there is new research that has come out within the past couple months that shows that even when your stove is off, when you are not combusting methane, that gas stove is leaking methane, one, into your home, but also benzene, xylene, ethyl xylene, toluene, all of these volatile organic components are the same pollutants that are found in secondhand smoke. So if you have a gas stove, it is essentially like you have a horrible roommate who is chain smoking in your kitchen day in and day out, not ventilating it, not doing anything and filling your home with BTEX. BTEX is benzene, toluene, eth uh, ethylene, and uh, ethyl xylene and xylene. There you go. Um, those are the exact same pollutants found in secondhand smoke. So Ultimately, if you want to completely reduce your risk of fossil fuel pollution, it's ripping that thing out of the wall and replacing it with an electric stove. I'm going to give a little bit of a spotlight to the electric induction cooktop. There are electric stoves that are not induction. If you're concerned about, is my pan going to work? I can't afford the induction. It's too expensive. There are electric stove options that are better than the 90s resistance coil nonsense and not as expensive as induction. However, I wanna give a little bit of a spotlight to induction because a couple of reasons. It's electric, boogie, woogie, woogie. Um, there is no indoor fossil fuel pollution when you use an electric cooktop. Indoor is doing a lot of weight in that sentence because uh, the majority of electricity in the United States is generated by the combustion of fossil fuels. So there's, fossil fuel pollution next to the power plant giving you the electricity, but in your home, there is very little fossil, there's no fossil fuel pollution when you use an electric stove. Next, it lowers household accident risk, and this is due to how induction works. Induction works, there is a metal wire underneath this glass ceramic cooktop, and an electric current is put through that wire. That electric current generates a magnetic field. That magnetic field interacts with the particles in your pot or pan, and the pot or pan particles resist it, and that's what generates the heat. It's a magnetic, electromagnetic interaction, not direct flame to material conduction interaction. So when you use an induction stove, only the pot or the pan is going to get hot not the entire appliance. Like, you know how you, if you have an oven on and then you turn your burner on and your gas stove, the entire appliance gets screaming hot. So if you have a little one touch and grab it and oops, they touch the range, they burn their hand. When you use an induction stove and little ones touch and grab in, don't let them touch the bottom of the pan, that's gonna be hot. But the entire appliance itself is not going to be screaming hot. So it lowers household accident risk. Also for explosions, methane is explosive. It lowers the risk of gas explosions because it's not using gas. And next, it's an investment in your family's health. 
I know not everyone is made of money right now, and especially during COVID and with inflation, Americans have fallen on really hard times, and replacing an entire kitchen appliance may not be high up on the financial priority list, and it may not even be possible if you rent. However, like I said before, there are some single and double burner plug-in induction options that are cheaper than replacing an entire appliance. So if your child's having a hard time breathing in the home and you notice these respiratory issues, big butcher block, put it right on the gas range and plug in, plug out induction burners. While there is larger scale, more macro level policy work to reduce the levels of ambient air pollution and to provide some financial help to get folks to be able to get the gas out of their home and replace it with an electric option. We'll be talking, I'm assuming we're gonna be talking a little bit about that in the Q&A portion when we talk about the IRA and what tax incentives and discounts uh, the IRA provides for uh, replacing your gas stove with an electric stove. All right, we are almost done, I promise you. Thank you so much for your attention. Before we wrap up and get to the q and I do want to just flag something for you all, which is being touted as a solution, but it certainly is not. It is the epitome of greenwashing from the oil and gas industry. And this is called hydrogen blending. This is something you might have heard about already. It is a big uh, initiative in the gas industry right now. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it is another wonderful opportunity for you as a health professional or a concerned citizen to raise your voice and make sure that hydrogen is not in our homes. So essentially what the gas industry is proposing is that they will blend hydrogen gas, which we get from fossil fuels, so even more fossil fuels, blend hydrogen gas with methane gas, therefore lowering their carbon footprint using less fossil fuels and ultimately re, you know reducing the amount of emissions they have the, all three of those are a lie and i'll tell you why first and foremost it's bad for the climate to be able to get hydrogen gas in a form that we use the majority of hydrogen gas is gray hydrogen which is using steam methane reformation taking methane and heating it pressurizing it and getting hydrogen gas out of it. So we need to extract more methane to get hydrogen to then reduce the amount of methane that we're using. The math isn't mathing right. It's not adding up. It doesn't make sense. Next, it's bad for our health. When you combust hydrogen and methane together, you get more NO2 than if you were to just combust methane alone. So it's bad for our health. It's bad for the climate. Let's not allow it in our homes. Hydrogen has a place in the green future. You know, a shipping container ship cannot run on a Tesla lithium ion battery. You know, we can use green hydrogen to power that ship. We do not need to use hydrogen to fry an egg. So if you would like to learn more about hydrogen blending, I just dropped a, a link in the chat. PSR National uh, dropped a big report all about the dangers of hydrogen blending if you would like to learn more about that. Um, folks, if I could ask another favor and if you could uh, take this short pre-test, you know, I'll drop the link in the chat. And if you have a smartphone, by all means, scan that QR code. Um, I'm not going to pause for three minutes right now and let us do it. Please open the link in, in a tab and after we're done, take it. Um, it, would, it would help us a lot. It really helps us to see how well this webinar does with learning. And we also have some, you know, how well did we do? One out of five. Would you recommend it? Uh, what did you like? What could we improve upon? So we would really, really uh, appreciate that feedback. So it doesn't have to be now, but please, if you could take that short pretest. Um, this is just uh, a little slide saying all of the wonderful things that PSR chapters, including the lovely PSR Colorado, who is hosting us today, uh, has done in the building electrification space um, to uh, electrify our homes and reduce the amount of fossil fuels that are in our homes. And specifically, I, I just want to, I'm not going to read this entire paragraph, but um, in terms of building zoning codes and the future of not having gas in the home, it's not a long shot. It's not 10 years away. The entire state of Washington, thanks to PSR Washington and some other, uh, and many other organizations in the state, uh, Governor Inslee signed a policy that said, 
all new construction for high density residential and commercial buildings, you will not have a gas connection by 2031. And that is Washington State's building code policy. So it is not a long shot. This is an actual concrete policy that is existing right now in a state in the United States of America. So I'll just say that to say there's a light at the end of the tunnel and there are examples across the country of what we can do to make sure gas is not in our homes. Um, if this has lit a fire under your butt and you want to continue working on it, uh, I highly advocate for you to join PSR, PSR National or PSR Colorado. Um, we have at National a climate ambassador program that I just dropped a link in the chat. You'll be able to work with us uh, hand in hand on clean energy and sustainability issues. Um, and it is a wonderful group to be a part of. Uh, and this is how you will uh, claim your credit. Uh, you can scan that QR code and you will also receive a follow-up email from me uh, with detailed instructions from our creditor as to how to get um, uh, credit for this hour and this for this presentation. And with that, thank you all for listening to me talk at you for 60 minutes. Uh, thank you so much. These are all of my references. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And by all means, let's start a rousing and wonderful um, Q&A session. So let me start off with these questions that are in the chat. So I see from Polly, uh, who has uh, asked her question, this is about the childhood um, respiratory issues. And then from Chital, uh, seeking some health influencers, seeing some health influencers saying, it's fine if you just crack a window, but to recall what you said today, that's not true because methane is always burning. Not everyone has a vent and some neighborhoods have poor uh, outdoor air quality to opening a window uh, doesn't help. So. Chital, thank you very much for um, asking this question because this does this gets into the nuance of this issue because opening a window is an imperfect solution. It is kind of it is the low hanging fruit, I'll say, for solutions. Um, if you cannot replace your gas stove, if you do not have an exhaust hood, and changing to a plug-in, plug-out induction burner or air fryer just isn't a possibility right now. If all of those you cannot do, fine, yes, crack a window. However, ventilation is not enough because we have outdoor air quality that could be bad. It could be wildfire season. It could be 106 degrees. It could be negative four degrees. It could be, you know, there are, it could be a hurricane. It could be a blizzard. There are all of these factors where cracking a window isn't feasible for your comfortability living in your home. And also it doesn't do everything. It opening a window will not reduce that down to zero. It'll reduce the amount of air pollution you have, but not to zero. Um, so yes, it is, I'll, I'll say that it is, we say, we include it when we discuss our, you know, what you, what could you do, but it is the bare minimum low hanging fruit um, solution. So I hope that uh, answers your question. Uh, Ron, I see, may I add a comment about the range hood in the photo on the current slide? I'm assuming this was the uh, photo of the kitchen. Um, Ron, if you're still with us, I will, uh, oh, Ron is unfortunately not with us, so I, uh, don't know what Ron's comment was, unfortunately. Um, and then Sally, will the IRA include money for upgrading home electricity to switch to an electric or induction stove? Wonderful question, Sally, because I actually have a link that I can drop right into the chat for you, uh, right now. So this is from consumerreports.org, um, and this lays out every single tax credit and the discounts that uh, you can get by uh, through the IRA. So for it, yeah. So ultimately, the short answer to your question is yes. The IRA has funds in it to help you replace your gas stove with an electric induction stove. Now, the specific amount of money that you're going to get is actually income dependent. And it is based on what the average income for your zip code, I believe it is, is. So if you make 
above a certain percentage of your average zip code's income, you won't get as big of a discount. But if you uh, don't make an, a, as much as your uh, zip code's um, income, then you will get a higher discount. Um, I'm seeing here just directly quoting from the Consumer Reports article. Um, there is $4.5 billion in funding for states for rebates for the purchase of new electric appliances, including ranges, cooktops, and wall ovens. Um, for example, a rebate of up to $840 on a new electric cooking appliance and up to an additional $500 to help cover the cost of converting from natural gas or propane to electric. Um, so that consumer report has the nitty gritty details, you know, up to 80%, more than 80%, all of the income based things. Um, so that is a great resource. But ultimately, yes, there is funding in the IRA for you to switch to uh, switch your cooking to electric, to switch your HVAC system to electric, to take out your furnace and replace it with a heat pump and uh, for an electric vehicle. Uh, I do believe... Uh, I see uh, one more in the question box. And then Harv, I do know you have your hand up and I'll get to you right in a minute. Um, another is do ventilation hoods that don't vent outside actually do anything? The filters do not look like they would filter fine particles and certain certainly not NOx. Um, yes, good question. So like my, my exhaust hood, the fan in my microwave that is just, you know, creating airflow in my kitchen, um, if they are not venting it outside, it's it's venting it back into your kitchen. And that's that is a situation where you would have to combine it with that ventilation strategy and the open window. Again, this is the barest of minimum, lowest hanging fruit um, because you would want the airflow that non-vented uh, ventilation exhausted, to flow towards where it could be vented outside. But again, what is it doing? Up for debate, um, which is why we say, ultimately just stop using it. Big butcher block, put it on the gas range, and then those electric plug in plug out appliances. If you're really concerned about this air pollutants, which you should be, um, it's ultimately reducing the amount that you are turning that on. Hope that answered your question. And Harv, I there you go, Harv. I believe you can uh, unmute yourself now. Uh, thanks, Zach. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I think it's also important, if you don't mind, that we don't uh, gloss over some of the uh, some of the issues that people might have when they switch to induction. Um, first of all, if you have a gas a gas stove now. Uh, and you didn't have an electric at some point, then you might have uh, not adequate wiring to switch the induction. Uh, my induction stove takes a, a three, three or four prong plug, uh, but some people may not have that. They might just have a 110 or, uh, and so it may require some, some contractor to come in and do some wiring. So that, that should be a consideration. Um, another thing is that there may be, uh, for medical people, there may be considerations for people who have pacemakers uh, in using uh, induction stoves. So that's a point that we, we want to be sure that people know that not, uh, there may be some special health concerns that people with pacemakers should check with a, a physician first. Um, on the countertop, on the portable countertops, I, I had one of those also. And um, People need to know that they you shouldn't set them on metal surfaces. They need they can't be set on on uh, what do they call those ferromagnetic surfaces. So they have to be set on on uh, you know countertop or a, a wooden a butcher block, as you said. They also tend to draw a fair amount of amps amperage. So it's usually recommended that nothing else be plugged in, uh, at least in the same outlet. Sometimes in the same circuit. Um, so those are just some of the things that you know we don't want to just say this is this is just the 100 percent perfect solution for everything these are the real world solutions and so there are some real world considerations that we have to make at the same time um and the last thing i wanted to say is that the guy who wanted to ask about the the hood stove and your picture it may be that he was going to comment 
that the the uh, the hood did not extend far enough over the the stove. The research that was done out of Berkeley uh, showed that those uh, hood hood fans that extend uh, you know at least to the end of the stove do best at removing the uh, the pollutants. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Harv. Um, and thank you for bringing that up. I do have to admit that um, kitchen picture was just one of the free public domain <laughs> pictures of a kitchen that we we could get. But thank you. I'll be sure to uh, include that when we do this um, training uh, again. And thank you so much for also bringing up the uh, pacemaker and um, implanted medical device concerns for induction cooking. Um, following this, this presentation in a follow-up email, you all will get um, a follow-up email from me with every single link I dropped into the chat, the instructions on how to get credit, the slides, and also two fact sheets from PSR National. One is much more geared towards patients and the general public, not a lot of words, a lot of pictures, and it's big ticket items. The second one is specifically for health professionals, and there is a section on that fact sheet that talks about um, risk factors for induction for um, pacemakers and for implanted medical devices and for um, the, the motors in um, insulin pumps. Uh, the research has shown that, yes, because it is an electromagnetic device, it will interact with other Electric, electric and electromagnetic components like a pacemaker. However, you need to be, I think it is inches away from the uh, magnetic field itself, which is quite literally like lying on top of your induction stove for it to have a, quite a serious effect. Um, so yes, absolutely. It is something that folks who have implanted medical devices should talk to their physicians about, but it is not something that like you turn on the burner standing in front of it and all of a sudden your pacemaker fails. Um, but thank you, Har, for bringing that up because that is an incredibly important point. Um, okay, folks. So it seems like we have uh, answered all the questions in the Q&A and in the chat. Thank you all for your kind words. And I'll turn it over to uh, Lauren to wrap us up in the in the uh, last 10 minutes. Thank you so much for your time, y'all. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation, Zach. I earned, I learned so much. I even earned a few things uh, <laughs> because I learned and uh, am aware now that there is a double electric cooktop available for hardly any more than the single one. I do have an induction, single induction cooktop that I just take out and put on the counter. We don't have a lot of space, but it's very easy, very small, very lightweight and easy to plug in. Um, but I, wa I, I want to get that butcher block and just cover my stove and put two burners up there. Maybe I'll buy two double burners for, you know, under $300 and I'll be done with the darn stove, you know? So <laughs> thank you very much for that uh, and all the other amazing information. So I just wanted to follow up and uh, I can share one other little video that we have on our webpage. Um, it mentions some legislation that did pass before we're going to work on getting our legislators interested uh, in making adoption of healthy electric homes, including induction stoves, more affordable. Um, there needs to be better ways for us all to access the information that we need, such as the question, um, you know, will the IRA pay for an electric upgrade? to allow for this, not just the appliance itself, but for an electric upgrade. I want to know that personally too. Um, so I'm on a mission personally to discover how we can have healthy electric homes, including the stove. Um, so I invite you all to join me on that. I invite you all and I will you know, communicate with you all to give you opportunities to advocate on policy, whether you're in Denver and you want our code to um, eliminate gas hookups for single family homes, uh, whether you're in the suburbs and you want our suburban communities to be more aware of what's happening in Denver and Crested Butte and other places in our state and across the country that are finding ways to get gas out of homes and reduce the climate and health impacts that um, is associated with using gas in, in the homes. So um, also I'm very excited to be working with Black Parents United Foundation and we're having a February 22nd um, 
presentation with them, like I said before, at Brother Jeff's Cultural Center here in Denver. Um, I've learned a lot from Black Parents United Foundation. They are doing environmental justice, leadership training, and policy making um, sessions on uh, focused on asthma. And what I've learned about asthma, I do not have it. I haven't known a lot of people with it, but you know, asthma is just one thing, right? We don't, you know, if you don't know what it is, um, I have, you know, attended their sessions and listened to the youth who experienced this, what they have to do to deal with it. When you think about the impacts of asthma, it's a, it's like a punch in the chest. You're like you are, you know, you cannot do anything if you're having an asthma attack. You often have to go to the hospital. You cannot breathe. I mean, this is really, it's like being choked. It's a very, very serious impact. The medications can be very expensive or hard to get. Um, going to the hospital for a child, for an adult, for an elderly person has a huge family impact. It is not to be taken lightly. And our indoor air is a consideration in this. Use of gas in general is a consideration and also fracking and all the environmental pollutants that in, uh, disproportionately impacted communities experience are a huge problem. And so I will follow up with you on all kinds of opportunities to advocate. I hope you'll join us on February 26th. I'll make sure you know about that. Um, and we need to stop the fracking permits. There is a huge swath, miles wide swath of new permits already approved by the COGCC uh, called a comprehensive aerial plan called Box Elder. And it starts at 66th Avenue and goes down past Iliff all along the Eastern side of the Denver Metro. There will be at least 151 wells if we don't, and the, it has already been approved as of November 3rd, but there are secondary stages where we can at least make noise to try to stop the drilling from happening. And I will be in touch with you about that. Also farther south, part of this miles wide band of fracking that they have planned is Aurora Reservoir and the people living near Aurora Reservoir are resisting permitting down there. So they're organizing, many of our groups are working with them. We want this to be the second permit that the COGCC has ever denied. They've only ever denied one in the decades they've existed. And that was very recent. This could be number two. And then there's also another proposal near Loveland that could be the third one that we work together to deny because there is resistance in both places. Let's support our communities in keeping fossil fuel, indust industrial fossil fuel production out of our neighborhoods and away from disproportionately impacted communities in Aurora that have enough to contend with. High asthma rates, yes. So, and we can also show Aurora what Denver's doing and together Aurora and Denver can do more um, to protect us in our homes and protect our outdoor air from ozone as well as our climate. So I look forward to getting together with you and uh, thanks so much for listening and being here. Um, We'll follow up. I appreciate you all so much. Thank you. Thank you all so much for a wonderful evening. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your nights. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Lauren, for coordinating and for hosting us today. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All righty, y'all. Have a good night. Much gratitude. Good night. Thank you, Zach.